Hi, I'm Professor Eugene Kantorovich. It's a great pleasure to be here to talk to you about this very important subject. I know you've heard a lot about these issues on campus. The goal of our talk today, let me just set up the parameters of what we're going to discuss, is to talk about the legality of Israel's presence in the area called the West Bank and also the Golan from the perspective of international law. And it's import that's an important qualification. From the perspective of international law does not mean who's right, who was there first, who does God want to have this land. There are other people in this building who are better suited for addressing those questions. And international law may not coincide with those answers. There's absolutely no reason that international law, which as we'll see, is made by the countries of the world, is necessarily going to coincide with what is right, what is moral, what God wants. That would be nice if it were true. It's not necessarily the case, so I make no advertisements for the uh, goodness of international law. Why talk about it? Because I'm sure, as you've heard, discussions about Israel, the West Bank, settlements, are inevitably framed in terms of international law. You've heard about illegal settlements, illegal occupation, apartheid. These are all legal claims. And as such, we should be able to assess their validity by looking at international legal sources. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at what are the international legal sources, the authoritative international legal sources that govern this question. That's what we're going to do. So let me take a step back. And what is international law? So that's, that's a good question. Unlike, you know what American law is, there's Congress and they pass laws. There is a, a legislature in Tallahassee and they pass laws. Who is the international legislature? It's not the United Nations. They don't pass laws. There is no international Congress, and there is no international rulemaking body. Rather, there are two main ways international agreements are made. Treaties and custom. Just like in Jewish law, custom, minhag, can become binding. If countries do things, if all countries regularly do things, with a sense of legal obligation, that creates a rule, a customary rule of international law. What do these two things have in common? International law is made by countries. That is to say, countries can only be governed when they agree to a rule that will govern them. Treaties, custom. So what is not international law? Why do I have to give you this little mini shear in what's international law? Because not everything that has the word international in it makes international law. So for example, you will hear many general assembly resolutions calling not just Israel's presence in the West Bank illegal. The General Assembly has famously called the very existence of the State of Israel illegal in its Zionism is Racism resolution. So if the General Assembly was a law-making body, I could uh, save my voice and step down now and say, we're done. General Assembly has said it's illegal. The General Assembly does not make international law. How do I know that? Is it because I don't like what they say? No. It's because the United Nations Charter the Constitution of the United Nations, which creates the General Assembly, spells out its powers, and making rules is not one of them, making laws. So what, what's it mean when the General Assembly votes? Has anyone, anyone know about politics, about Congress? You know how sometimes a house will make a one house resolution. Like the House of Representatives will vote to make Tuesday, you know, uh, Chinese food day, and Wednesday, talk like a pirate day. They have these one house votes. Those votes aren't laws, because a law has to be passed by both houses and sound by the president. So why do they make these sense of the Senate resolutions or one house resol resolutions? To express their opinion. That's what they're doing. Same with the General Assembly. So General Assembly resolutions, you could have a thousand of them, and you do have a thousand of them on this subject, uh, and they do not have legal status. What else does not have international legal status that you might hear about a lot? So you may know that the International Court of Justice issued an opinion in a case involving Israel's wall that was being built in the West Bank largely, in which it declared Israel's occupation to be illegal and a violation of international law. It did not offer much analysis for that point. Why is this not a binding statement of international law? It's the International Court of Justice. So the opinion is what's called an advisory opinion. What's an advisory opinion? It's an opinion in a case in which the court, by its own constitution, does not have the authority to issue 
a binding resolution. What's an advisory opinion? It's advice. Advice. And by the way, let me tell you something about this advisory opinion. The advisory opinion was a response. Who can ask for an advisory opinion? I can't go to the ICJ and say, I'm having a problem writing my international law article. Can you give me some, an advisory opinion on what international law is? The General Assembly of the United Nations asked for this advisory opinion. And if any of you are planning to go to law school, which uh, Jews tend to do, uh, you, you'll see there's this amazing trick. When you're arguing in court, the way you frame the question is crucial for the answer. A court really can't answer outside of the framework of the question. Listen to the question that the General Assembly submitted to the ICJ. Bearing in mind that Israel, the occupying power, continues to refuse to comply with international law vis-a-vis -vis its construction of the above-mentioned wall with all its detrimental implications and consequences, what are the legal consequences from the construction of the illegal wall being built by Israel? So, and the court said, um, illegal? Uh, which, uh, so the input is not, uh, the output is indistinguishable from the uh, input. There was no value added. Again, it's an advisory opinion. We're going to look to binding sources of international law. That is to say, actual treaties, things that countries have made authoritative. Security Council resolutions of certain kind fall into this, um, uh, into this uh, category. Why Security Council resolutions of a certain kind and not General Assembly resolutions? Because the treaty that created the United Nations, which all the countries have signed, says the Security Council can make binding decisions because of the way it's constructed. The General Assembly is just like uh, a town hall meeting. Everyone gets up and says their opinion. Okay, so I said we're not gonna talk about who was where first, who came first, but so this is, this, is, this is just gonna be a blink of an eye in Middle Eastern terms. Let's just go back to 1516, not long. So what's great about this is I can cover 400 years in one slide. From 1516 to 1917, all of the area we're talking about, Lebanon and Syria, Israel, and everything around Israel, belonged to the Ottoman Empire, which was based in Turkey. Islamic, non-Arabic empire. And it ruled much of the Middle East. And up to 1917, all of this clearly belonged to the Ottoman Turk. Uh, those different colored areas are internal administrative divisions of the area of Palestine. You see, they divided it into three districts, north and south, which do not look, by the way, as you may notice, like the division between Israel and the West Bank. They look more like the division between the northern, central, and southern commands of Israel. Uh, nobody argued that there was any problem with Ottoman sovereignty up to 1917. So up to 1917, we are clean. That's easy. So we're going to cover the first few thousand years of the world without any concern. Everyone agrees it belonged to the Ottoman Turks. Was that good? Was that nice? Wasn't a question. Ottoman Turks up to 1917. What happened in 1917, and this is crucial, the Ottoman Empire, along with Germany and Austria, were on the losing side of World War I. And as a result of World War I, all of the large, losing, multi-ethnic empires were broken up as part of the peace process. So the Allies had a peace conference, you may have heard of it, in Versailles in 1919. And they said, the problem with Austro-Hungary, remember they shot the, the Serbs, killed the Archduke Ferdinand? So it was, there were all these ethnic minorities living in one pan-ethnic empire. They, didn't, they thought, that, that's a problem. We're going to give each country, we're going to make independent nation states. They did that in Europe breaking up Austria-Hungary into Poland, into Austria, Czechoslovakia, half the countries you've heard of in Europe now. And they did the same in the Middle East, breaking up the Ottoman Empire into new independent nation states. And this was finally agreed to at a big international conference called San Remo. This was not a colonialist thing. Every country in the world was there. China, Japan, Ethiopia, and they all voted unanimously to create the system in the Middle East of new nation states. Unlike in Europe, where there was some history of parliamentary democracy in these new countries, Poland, Czechoslovakia, none of the Middle Eastern countries had a history of democracy. So they were going to be overseen by certain European powers as they transitioned to democracy. Right, so America occupied Afghanistan until they set up a government. Same type of thing. It's a transition occupation. And different European powers were assigned different parts of the former Ottoman Empire to steer to statehood. And this was called the mandate system. The mandate system. And 
What is central for our purposes is the League of Nations mandate for Palestine. You've often heard of it referred to perhaps as the British mandate. And the League of Nations, what is the League of Nations? It was the predecessor to the Security Council between the wars. And it had, by its constitution, when it was created after World War I, the authority to make binding international decisions. All the countries agreed to this. And then this body, created by all the countries, came to the following resolution. To favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Palestine was going to be a national home for the Jewish people because of the historical link of the Jews to Palestine. No other people's historical rights to Palestine were noticed, were recognized. The Jewish people, the international community recognizes the historical connection. Who is the League of Nations? You have to understand this. The League of Nations is everyone. The whole world voted for this. The whole world approved this. And Britain was going to create a Jewish state in Palestine. What is Palestine? That whole thing in blue is Palestine. And you'll see it includes the area of Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, Golan Heights, and the entire area that is now called the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. That was all supposed to be used for the creation of a Jewish state under an authoritative international resolution of the border issue. Now, today in college, a lot of people would say to you, why should we care about this League of Nations mandate, this British mandate? First of all, it's old. It was like 100 years ago. Who cares about that? And it sounds like European colonialism, because it has the word British in it, and it takes place in the Middle East. So this was just like some favor from like Britain to the Jews. So scratch out that last possibility. The British didn't like the Jews. Nobody liked the Jews. This was part of a much larger settlement. So here's the thing. The only thing you will ever hear about, probably in your lives, unless you specialize in this area, is the British mandate for Palestine. The British mandate for Palestine was one of a gazillion mandates issued for these same purposes to create countries on the same day in San Remo as part of the same process. So as you see, Syria was actually called the French mandate for Syria, from which was created Syria and Lebanon. Iraq was called the British mandate for Mesopotamia. And there were other mandates created in other places. There were, I believe, 26 different mandates created, all of which later became countries or multiple countries. What does this mean? Every border that we have here, all of these lines dividing up all of the countries in the Middle East, all of them owe themselves to the League of Nations mandate process. That is to say, how do we know that this is the border between uh, Syria and Israel, or Syria and Iraq, or Syria and Turkey up here? Those were all the borders that were drawn in the League of Mandate process. And in no other context do we say, oh, that was 100 years old and has the word British in it. Let me give you an example. So what France did with this mandate, they did something like what Britain was going to do here. They cut it up into two countries. Lebanon was going to be a majority Christian Arab country, and Syria was going to be a majority Muslim Arab country. Now, Syria today, if you look in Syria's maps, Lebanon is not, does not exist in Syria's maps, and that's why Syria occupied Lebanon for a long time. Because Syria always said, no, 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 Lebanon's part of us, because we can't go by this 100-year-old mandate thing. Not a country in the world accepted that argument. Do you remember when Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait? No, you don't. Uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and he said, this is part of Iraq. Now, he wasn't just being mean and making things up. He said, before the mandate process, this was a province of Iraq. And just based on the maps that they drew for the British mandate of Mesopotamia, they took that away from us. So it's part of it. Not a single country in the world said, oh, yeah, who cares about those 100-year-old mandates with the word British in it? They said, no, these borders are the borders. So if you call into question the borders of the mandate period, you actually call into question the border of every single country in the Middle East. None of these, all of these countries were created through the mandate process. And the questions only seem to be raised in the area of Israel. Article 25 of the mandate specifically says, if there are not enough Jews to have a country in this whole big thing, Britain can cut this, cut this part off and make a separate thing there. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But anyway, Britain did that right away. And here they created the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Uh, the League of Nations mandate doesn't actually say that they can make a different country there. They say they can suspend the mandate, 
which suggests maybe it's temporary, but Britain cut this off and said, okay, that's no longer Palestine. So all we're left with from 1925 is this part, and that's where, that's Palestine, Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. And that is where, under the League of Nations mandate, the Jewish state is supposed to arise. So if the Jordanians, for example, why does Jordan exist? The British mandate for Palestine. The very same mandate. And no one ever doubts Jordan's right to exist or its particular borders. Okay. What is a mandate? A mandate is like a trusteeship. You know, sometimes people have parents with a lot of money. God forbid the parents die. They hire a trustee to make sure the person doesn't get the money until he gives up fast cars and things like this. Okay. That's what this is. By the way, this system, this mandate system, which sounds old and kind of um, colonial, it continued to exist into the United Nations system uh, after World War II. They just renamed it the Trusteeship Council. And America was a trustee of several countries well into the 90s. Uh, so usually in trustee law, what's the concern? Usually you're worried that the trustee, the guy who's sitting around guarding the money, is going to run away with it while the young guy's driving the fast cars. Normally, so the guy, you're afraid the trustee will take the money and run. What happened with the British mandate is very unusual. The trustee left the money and ran. What's that mean? Britain, said, Britain after World War II, Britain was supposed to create a, a country here, and they said, look, we know that the Arabs and the Jews are going to go at it as soon as we say there can be a Jewish state. Britain was supposed to get, turn over the keys to the Jews, so to speak. But they said, as soon as we do that, we're going to get caught in the middle of this big Arab-Jewish war. And indeed, that's, uh, you see, they've cut off the Jordan. They've cut off Jordan, and they gave another part to France. Uh, so they said, indeed, there's going to be a big war here. We're getting out of here. Jews, if you want your own state, take it yourselves. We're not setting anything up. We're, they were broke after World War II. We're out of here. And they took off. Now, when it became clear, when the British announced that they were leaving, the world understood that there was going to be a big war here. And so the General Assembly, the newly created General Assembly, and this is very important, you're going to hear this quoted all the time, sent fact finders, experts, to the area to try to propose some kind of solution. And they said, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take, okay, so remember, this is Palestine at first, then Britain cuts it in half. So now, and they said, well, we're going to take this, what's left of it, and we're going to cut it into six little pieces. And we're going to give the Jews three pieces which touch at a corner, and we're going to give the Arabs three pieces that touch at the corner. So all that will be left of the Jewish state is this, this, and this, these little parts touching at the corners. Note that Yaffa, have you all been to Yaffa, a very beautiful place in southern Tel Aviv? You should go. Uh, that was supposed to be an Arab city in southern Tel Aviv. And as you see, Jerusalem and everything around Jerusalem, Beit Shemesh, was, this was all going to be Arab. And Jerusalem was going to be an international city supervised by these kind of like um, Canadian police people. Um, they never arrived, actually, because wh while they were on the boat, they heard that there was like actually fighting in Jerusalem. And they said, oh, we didn't understand this was like a shooting job. And they turned around and uh, they went home. So everywhere around Jerusalem was going to be uh, Arab country. This was the, Jerusalem, the partition proposal. What legal status does this partition proposal have? None. Why? Because it's the General Assembly, firstly. Secondly, there's another article in the United Nations Charter that says that they cannot change the rights of people under mandates uh, through the United Nations. So Israel, by the way, accepted this deal. The leadership of the Jewish community in Israel said, OK. And the Arabs said no. If everyone had said okay, then it would probably become binding international law, because how does international law get made? By the agreement of countries. So if two countries agree to this is going to be our border, that's a binding decision. But, the, but they don't agree. And you will often hear that Israel was created, or Israel's legitimacy was recognized by the General Assembly partition proposal. Or that in 1947, the UN authorized or recognized Israel. Far from the truth. Was it, Israel was already recognized from the League of Nations mandate. Everything in international law with Israel begins with the League of Nations mandate. This doesn't recognize the mandate. It tries to chisel away at the mandate. Now, the, so the Arabs say no, and a war immediately begins. By the way, there had been other pro partition proposals. The Jews in the 30s even accepted this suggestion from Britain, where only that tiny little kind of orange area would be Jewish. Uh, and the Arabs also said no. Okay. 
here we're getting, we're getting to the so-called 1967 borders, which, as we'll see, have nothing to do with 1967 and are not borders. Uh, OK, so this looks familiar, probably. The, the Arabs invaded Israel. Five Arab armies, Egypt coming up here, Transjordan led by the British, right? the people who love the Jews. The Jordanian army was led by British officers. The Syrians, the Lebanese, the Iraqis walked across Jordan to participate in the fun. The Saudis came. Everyone was there. OK. We're, this is what the fighting, this is what the situation looked like when the fighting stopped. This is the, what, this line is what you call the green line, right? Every time you hear the phrase the West Bank, Gaza, occupied territory, Israel, uh, territory that Israel is occupying, settlements across the green line, it is this line that we're talking about. And there are a few very important observations to make here. Firstly, this line never existed in the history of the world before 1949. What does that mean? That means this line does not track any underlying demographic, historical, political, topographic, or any other kind of realities. That's why it goes through a city. Right? It's, not an, it's, not a historic, it's not a historical division into administrative units. It doesn't look like any of the maps I showed you before. Where did this line come from? Why did they decide to draw a line like this? This line is simply where, how far back the Jews managed to push the Arabs. So remember, the Arabs invade from here. Their goal is to conquer this whole thing. So the Egyptians get all the way to the suburbs of Tel Aviv. And then the Haganah, the Israeli army, pushes them back this far, but can't push them all the way out. The Arab armies surround Jerusalem, push all the way up onto the hill here, and then they get stopped and pushed back a little and pushed halfway out of Jerusalem but not all the way. In other words, this is simply where the fighting stopped. This is, and indeed, these borders, these so-called borders, how were they fashioned? They were an armistice agreement between the warring armies. What's an armistice agreement? It's not a peace agreement. It's not a border agreement. It's a, we're going to stop shooting here for a little bit. This is like the ceasefire line. And this is what the armistice demarcation lines are. This is the very document that created those lines for the first time in the history of the world says, it is not to be construed in any sense as a political or territorial boundary. That's the Israeli-Jordanian armistice line. Why do the Jordanians not want it to be construed as a boundary? Because they're saying, uh, we're not done trying to conquer the rest of it. And Israel says, well, we're not done trying to win back this. We see a few, a few important things. The occupation of the West Bank, the military occupation of the West Bank, began in 1949 by Jordan. So in 19, remember, League of Nations mandate, up to 1948, all of this area was Palestine, reserved as a Jewish state by the League of Nations mandate. Jordan comes, and in a war that was at the time universally regarded as an aggressive war, chops off this part in an attempt to conquer the whole. So from 1949 to 1967, these areas were under Arab occupation, under the occupation of Egypt, and uh, Jordan, respectively. How many United Nations resolutions are there? From 19 so every year, there's, I would say, a few dozen United Nations documents and resolutions condemning the occupation of the West Bank, the Jewish occupation. How many United Nations resolutions mentioned the Egyptian and Jordanian occupation, and in the case of Jordan, purported annexation? They claim to conquer it and make it part of Jordan, of the West Bank. Zero. So it's an interesting thing. So apparently, occupation is not always a bad thing. Um, so what do we see here? First of all, why are they not 1967 borders? Well, first of all, they're not borders. And they were established in 49. 67 is when they were erased. They were established in 49 as an armistice line between the Israeli and Jordanian and Israeli and Egyptian forces. Nothing more. An important point emerges. Only two countries in the world, Britain and Pakistan, recognized Jordan's claim to the West Bank between 1949 and 1967. To say that this green line, this line, is in any way sticky, that is to say, that it is the beginning of the basis 
for Palestinian territorial claims, that Israel's rights are somehow limited or suspended in that area, the Jewish rights are limited or suspended in that area, what does it mean? It is to retroactively legitimize the Arab conquest of 1949. That is, that in 1949, no one thought that Jordan was entitled to take this. But to say now that that is in any way Palestinian territory, or that Israel's claims have been weakened to it, is to retroactively say, you know what, the Arabs get to keep what they, tried to, what they won in their war to destroy Israel. That's a, it seems hard to see why one would want to do that. 1967, Israel, there's a, Israel launches a war after Egypt tries to close off shipping to Israel and makes amazing conquests. Amazing conquests. They take Gaza and the West Bank, the Golan Heights from Syria, and the Sinai Peninsula. Wow, That's a, it's a lot for six days. Um, crucial point. Israel's international legal claim to the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights is going to be different and perhaps weaker than its claim to Gaza and the West Bank. Why? Why is that? They were included in the mandate. What is the West Bank in 1967? What is the status? Was it Jordanian territory? No. Was it Palestinian territory? No, because no one had ever heard of them. What, what was it? It was that part of the British mandate for Palestine, for a Jewish state in Palestine, that was illegally occupied by Jordan. So Israel has a very good claim to that. What's the international legal basis for Israel's right to this territory in blue? Why does Israel get to have that under international law? British mandate. And so it's, so it's, it's the same, not the armistice line, the British mandate. So the West Bank and Gaza Strip, that either belonged to nobody or belonged to Israel and it was taking it back. Those are the two possibilities, I think, under international law. It was not the recognized territory of any other sovereign. The Sinai Peninsula was undisputedly sovereign Egyptian territory. There was no doubt. That is, that if in 1966 you said, who does the Sinai Peninsula belong to? Everyone would say Egypt. If you said, who does the West Bank belong to? Nobody would say Jordan, the Arabs. So it's under Arab occupation. So those are very different legal statuses. Very different legal statuses. That is not to say that Israel is without a basis in international law for holding on to the uh, uh, Golan and the Sinai Peninsula. Ra what is the basis? D defensive conquest. No, no, so in 1917 they didn't give the Sinai and the Golan. Just what? Defensive conquest. So in international law, you are forbidden from acquiring territory by conquest, by aggressive conquest, unless you are Arabs trying to conquer the West Bank and Gaza from Israel. That seems to be a major exception. But other than that, or North Vietnam conquering South Vietnam, or China conquering Tibet, or Russia conquering Jordan. But okay, other than that, you're not allowed to, if you're Israel, you're not allowed to conquer that's clear international law says Israel is not allowed to conquer territory in aggressive wars. How do we know that? The UN Charter, basic international document, prohibits war as a weapon of state, as a tool of statecraft. It says war is illegal. You're not allowed to have aggressive war. So if war is illegal, obviously, if you break the rule and have a war, you shouldn't be allowed to keep that which you unlawfully take. Everyone with me? So Saddam Hussein gets kicked out of Kuwait, etc. Is there any exception to the illegality of war? Are they like Quakers, where, where they just won't have war at all under the United Nations? No. Article 52 of the United Nations has an exception to the illegality, a very fundamental exception, self-defense. So the right of self-defense, it's not just an exception, it's inherent. It's basic. You can always defend yourself. So not all war is illegal. What kind of war is legal? A defensive war. 1967 was, at the time, almost universally regarded as a defensive war. Afterwards, people wanted to say different because Israel won so miraculously, basically, that people, that people said the Arabs couldn't have had hostile intent because they got wiped out. But that was an unexpected circumstance, a highly unexpected circumstance. So if it's a defensive war, why would you have the rule prohibiting conquest? Re remember, why do we have the rule against conquest? Because aggression is illegal, so you couldn't, should not keep what you get illegally. But what if you get it legally? Then it seems the rule should not apply. Now, if you ask an international lawyer, 
If you ask all the other international lawyers, is defensive conquest permitted? They would say no. It is not also forbidden. Why is it forbidden, they would say? Because then people would claim self-defense to mask an aggressive conquest. They say self-defense, aggression, you can't really tell them apart. That's their argument. What's the problem with that argument? There are a few problems. One I would like to mention, if you can't tell self-defense and aggression apart, then the entire United Nations Charter peace system is incoherent because it is based on aggression being illegal and self-defense being legal. And if those two things are just fundamentally indistinguishable, then the UN Charter has some really basic problems. Um, so defensive war. Now, interestingly, so while Israel's legal claim to the Golan is weaker, you don't hear as much controversy about the Golan, even though the claim to the, is, is much weaker than the claim to the West Bank, which is much stronger. Um, OK. Remember that the Arab states were on the side of the Soviet Union. Israel was on the side of America. So this was like a big superpower standoff. And the whole world was in a tizzy about the Six-Day War. The United Nations Security Council met for a long time. And they tried to figure out what to do about this. And they really wanted some kind of agreed upon solution to have like, um, to avoid a superpower standoff. And they went through many drafts, and this is what they came up with. This is a very important resolution, 242. This, the United Nations passed this uh, subsequently in a way that would make it, make it legally binding, because the Security Council can do that. And this document becomes the basis of all future UN documents. So all future UN documents basically call for implementing 242. So my voice is going a little, and it's good because it seems 242 now we're at the end of the story. Read that. Withdrawal of Israel from territories occupied in the recent conflict. What territories are those? That's the whole West Bank, Gaza Strip, Jerusalem's right here, go on, and Sinai. Okay. So the Security Council says Israel has to give it all back. Now, what if I told you? What if I told you? Well, look, maybe it doesn't have to give everything back because it doesn't say withdraw of the armed forces from all the territories. You'd say, I've been spending too much time in the Gemara Shia, right? This is like a, a, a little bit too much casuistry, too much Talmudic logic. It doesn't say all of the, maybe it just means some of the. Okay. What if I, so what if I told you something even more interesting? When this resolution was first proposed by one of the Soviet-aligned countries, United States, and it, it actually said all of the territories. That's what it first said. And it went through five different drafts that said versions of the territories, all of the territories. And in each case, America and Britain said, we're going to veto that. Israel shouldn't have to withdraw from all the territories. First of all, it's never going to do it, so it's just going to make the UN look stupid. This was before people routinely stopped doing what the UN suggested. Uh, There's going to be one of those resolutions that get ignored. And Israel, it would be suicidal for Israel to do it, and they'll never, never give up the temple, and like, uh, this is not something that can happen. Too much to ask for. So let's say some of the territories. And then the Soviet Arab countries said, no, 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 that's not enough. Then they could maybe just like withdraw from a few feet. And, we're not happy with that. And so finally, they did what diplomats do. They said, let's not say some of the, and not, let's, let's not say all of the. Let's just say, generally, territories. So what did they actually agree to in this document? Nothing. They agreed to disagree. By the way, th this should not be surprising. This is the typical diplomatic outcome. You know we're about to have now in Congress the sequestration thing, where like the budget gets slashed by massive amounts of money? It's because they had an agreement like a year ago to not agree, and now we're, so, so they agreed to disagree. This is normal diplomatic stuff. By the way, has Israel complied with this resolution? Right, if it had just withdrawn from one foot and said, ha ha, territory, that might be a breach of bad faith. But they have withdrawn from uh, uh, yeah, hold on. They have withdrawn from 99% of the territory captured, that is to say, the Sinai Peninsula, Gaza, uh, and much of the West Bank. Okay. <laughs> in short, Israel has a strong legal claim to the West Bank based in the uh, League of Nations mandate. And uh, 
even 242, uh, and basic principles of international law. Uh, you will hear many people try to argue why these things don't apply in the case of Israel. The League of Nations mandate doesn't apply. The question to always ask is, show me another case where you apply the rule like this. I would challenge anyone to find another case, for example, where a defensive conquest has been called illegal. Right, so how do we make rules in law? Basic, when you hear people talking about Israel and international law, people make very strong statements. International law clearly says... Now, international law rarely says anything clearly because there's no central promulgating authority. And there usually are a, a, a thin number of precedents. What is a law? A law is a rule phrased in general terms applicable to unknown future situations. Show me a, the, the rule that gets generally applied that says any of these things. You'll note what I said about uh, the title to West Bank, that either it belongs to no one, disputed territory, or Israel has clear sovereignty. Why did I say that? Because there's no clear rule in international law to pick between those two possibilities. The situation in which um, a mandatory power abdicates and leaves it up for grabs, it's not clear. Does that mean that the title automatically vests in the country that has the rest of the territory? It's not clear. That's usually the answer in international law. And if someone is telling you something is a bit too clear, they're probably selling you something. OK. Settlements. What are settlements? We hear so much about the settlements. Settlements are a popular expression to refer to Jewish civilian presence in the West Bank after 1967. There was no Jewish civilian presence between 1949 and 1967 uh, because they were all kicked out by the Jordanians. There was a Jewish presence before 1949. They don't get discussed so much. After 67, Jewish presence becomes called settlement. And settlements are supposed to be illegal un under international law and the root of all our problems. Okay. First thing to understand, the entire discussion about settlements boils down to one word in one treaty and what it means. The idea that they're occupying anyone, the idea that building houses is a problem, the idea that settlers having babies is a problem, all comes down to one word, which we're about to see, in one treaty, which may not even apply to the conflict, and what it means. You will see that a meaning is tried to be put on that word, which I think is extravagant. The treaty, first of all, so there is no word called settlements in international law. You could like re read every international law, treaty. The word settlement is not used. Now, in the Geneva Convention, the Geneva Convention was passed in 1949, and it governs armed conflicts. There is a discussion about what's called population transfer. Now, the Geneva Convention may not apply at all to this conflict. Why not? Because the Geneva Convention applies to the occupation. So we have occupying power. What is an occupation under the Geneva Convention? It's when one country occupies the territory of another country. So why would the Geneva Convention not apply to the West Bank? Whose territory is it? Nobody, but, so, and to prove this point most strongly, between 1949 and 1967, when Jordan occupied the West Bank, and the international community didn't accept that it belonged to Jordan, but didn't accept that it was part of Israel either. Nobody thought that Jordanian construction, nobody said at least, that Jordanian construction in uh, the West Bank represents settlement or that the Geneva Convention applied there at all. And I looked very hard. I mean, like, nobody in any kind of document that one could find with reasonable amounts of research. Certainly no resolution. So let's say the Geneva Convention applies, which I think it does not. So we get down to Article 49 is all about attempts to change the demographic composition of occupied territory. These were things that Nazi Germany had done, like deporting people from the territory, moving colonists in. Most of it is about deporting people from the territory. But 49.6 says, the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population. OK, so nobody thinks that settlers are being deported. So really the question is, transfer. Transfer. First of all, who can violate the Geneva Convention? Who can commit a violation of the 49.6? The occupying power. 
Right? Because it's a treaty. Treaties are about the conduct of countries. So if a Yid decides to build himself a house in Gilo, a neighborhood in Jerusalem considered occupied territory, or wants to build himself a house in Efrat, in the, in the West Bank, it is very hard to see what Article 49.6 has to say about it in the first place. Right? This is about the occupying power. This is about mass organized movements of people. So if Jews want to move to these areas, which they do and which they have, for a variety of religious and economic and normal reasons, it doesn't seem that this addresses it at all. Indeed, in many cases, the Israeli government was opposed to the creation of settlements, and people would come to a hilltop, set up some tents, and they would get kicked out by the army. And the army would kick them out again, and they would kick them out again, and they would kick them out again, and finally the army would say, okay, we give up, you can stay. Nobody, it's agreed that what the word transfer means is not absolutely clear, but other international law professors want to read it to mean the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its civilian population into occupying territory, and if they wish to go there, they shall lay landmines, they shall put up machine gun posts, they shall block them, they shall prevent them, and anyone who sneaks through they shall forcibly evict. That's how they want to read it. It doesn't seem that that's what it says. It says the occupying power can't take parts of its civilian population, dump it in the, other, in, in the occupied area. It doesn't say anything that has to stop them. It, it certainly doesn't say that occupation would create a system of effectively an apartheid system of racially exclusive zones where nationals of the occupying country are not allowed to move into the other area. Certainly, it certainly does not say that. By the way, it shall not transfer. Let me just give you an example. Uh, anyone been to Jerusalem before? Great. Okay, so you know the central bus station? So you get to the central bus station. You want to go to the Kotel. What do you do? Today you probably get on the light rail, but you used to take a bus. So you get on the light rail, and you ride over to the Kotel. Under the, under the leading world interpretation, the way people want to spin this, of 49.6, you have just violated the Geneva Convention. Okay, you're not the occupying power, but we don't get why. You have transferred yourself, and I don't mean the transfer from the bus to the, uh, to, to the train. You have transferred yourself to occupied territory. That's it. They should have stopped you. They should have torn up the tracks. They even want to say, what about people who are born? Probably at least a third or a half of the so-called settlers didn't settle, they were just born. They want to read transfer to mean delivered. How can someone who was born in Yerushalayim, how can they be considered to have been transferred? It's very hard to understand. Mm. Okay, so settlements, I think not such a problem. I'm going to end on one final note. Apartheid. You're going to hear this all the time. What's the argument of apartheid? Israel is occupying the Palestinians, depriving them of the right to vote, etc., whatever. And this is a problem. Okay. So the Oslo process that began in 1993, you know the Palestinian Authority? It used to not exist. Like, I remember. There used to be no such thing. Israel said, Palestinians, you can have a government. And they have a government uh, which controls, the Palestinian Authority government controls 95% of the Palestinian civilian population lives in the areas of the West Bank and Gaza controlled by the Palestinian Authority. You've heard that one reason Israel should um, give up land to the Palestinians is because they have a democratically elected government. Yes? Mahmoud Abbas? He's legitimate because the Palestinians democratically elected him? Okay. So, here's the question. If the Jews are depriving the Palestinians of the right to vote, of the rights of citizenship, how did they democratically elect Mahmoud Abbas? That's the mystery to think about. That is to say, what the, the claim of apartheid is that Israel is obligated to let the Palestinians elect their own government and the Jewish government. They want to vote twice. They want to vote in Palestinian elections and in the Israeli elections. Okay, this is, the Palestinians actually have a country in which, I mean, I wouldn't say they vote like we vote, but they vote as much as people vote in the Arab world. Okay, do you know what plus 970 is? That's a country code to call up Palestine. .ps, 
top internet level domain name for Palestine. They have an army supplied by the United States. They have a central bank. They have ministries. They control the vast majority of the Palestinian population. They issue passports. They have government. They travel the world. They have foreign ministries. They have embassies. These are the countries in the world that recognize Palestine as a state. Almost as many as recognize Israel. Growing every day. And they have embassies there. These countries have embassies in Palestine. They've elected, I mean, again, I understand that Abbas is in the, like, something like 100th month of his 48 month term, but that's, that's their problem. They did at one point elect him uh, and can do so again. Um, they have a government. This was given to them. So it's very hard to understand what the apartheid is, other than that Jews are not allowed to vote at all in the Palestinian elections or live there or have any other kind of, uh, any other kind of land there. Uh,